Republican minority in Washington defending Congresswoman Liz Cheney, including Maryland Governor Larry Hogan on Meet the Press this weekend, Congressman Adam Kissinger on Sunday as well. It just bothers me that you have to swear fealty to uh, the dear leader or you get kicked out of the party. It's sort of a circular firing squad where we're just attacking members of our own party instead of focusing on solving problems. We're like, you know, in this in the middle of this slow sink, we have a band playing on the deck telling everybody it's fine. And meanwhile, as I've said, you know, Donald Trump's running around trying to find women's clothing and get on the first lifeboat. Well, joining me now, former White House Press Secretary to President Obama, of course, Robert Gibbs, former Republican National Chair Michael Steele, and Real Clear Politics Associate Editor and Columnist A.B. Stoddard. Welcome all. Gibbs, uh, what do you think of the, the infighting <laughs> that we're seeing on the Republican side? I guess, can Democrats take advantage of this? Or what say you about Liz Cheney being booted? Most well, likely, I Wednesday. think we've expected... Yeah, we've, we've sort of expected this now for a couple of weeks, but I don't think we should lose sight of the fact that this is going to be a truly remarkable moment for what was once called the Republican Party. Uh, th this is a, a point in which Dick Cheney's daughter, a member of the leadership, who's got a more conservative voting record than the woman trying to replace her, is going to be booted not because she isn't Republican enough, but because she isn't Trumpian enough. Uh, and I think this may not have huge implications for 2022, where there's going to be a smaller, more vocal Republican electorate, I think it will have outsized implications for 2024, uh, because it is hard to imagine anybody can run for president, either with or without Donald Trump in a Republican primary, uh, without pledging fealty to him, without denying the fact that this uh, election was done fairly, uh, and papering over exactly what happened uh, on January the 6th. And that's an incredible thing for the Republican Party to cast its lot in. And Michael Steele, I know you've been bemoaning this for quite some time, but this is the most graphic example. I also wanted to play Adam Kinziger again just this past hour. Uh, what he had to say, I guess he was at the National Press Club, about his Republican colleagues repeating the Donald Trump lies. Mm -hmm. I truly, truly, Emily, believe that maybe 10 of my fellow colleagues in the House believe that the election was stolen, maybe 10. I'm putting room in there for there are probably just some people that are not really all that, you know, uh, high IQ-ish on some things, I guess. Michael Steele, how would you put it? Uh, yeah, I, I think that nails it. <laughs> it's not, there's not a lot of IQ use being made here. Uh, this is one of the dumbest things uh, you can do in politics is to eat your own so publicly and so violently um, the way they've gone after uh, Liz Cheney. Uh, I have to give, uh, you know, I think AB nailed it about 10 days ago on our air when she said there was no political space left for Liz Cheney. Um, looking ahead to where we are now. Uh, and, and I think that's exactly right. It, this writing has been on the wall for a while now. And the question for the party is, all right, so what are you saying to the country? You're right, 2022 is going to be a turnout election for the base, but the test is going to be, do you believe this was uh, you know, a fraudulent election? Do you believe Donald Trump? And, and Kevin McCarthy told us, he said, you know, if they want a conference chair, who will promote the message? Well, the message is a lie. <laughs> OK, so can we just be honest about that? Just, just say, look, we want someone who will stand up next to me and lie to the country about what happened on January 6th and what happened in November of 2020. And that's all we want. And the fact that she wears a dress makes it better. But that's the bottom line. And, and I think we need to be honest about where this party is sinking to. And the reality, to, to pick up on A.B.'s point from 10 days ago, there's no political life or maneuverability left for this party. You know, and that's that's our reality right now. Yeah, it's a Republican primary vote. Uh, it's a midterm play, perhaps. But, A.B., where do they go from here? Well, that's what's so interesting. When you talk to members about why Liz Cheney survived, uh, a no confidence vote in February with a resounding margin, and then she's going to get kicked out now. They say, well, you know, we weren't bad about impeachment. We're Big Ten. But now she just insists on talking about this. And when you say, well, isn't it? Isn't she telling the truth? They say, that's fine. 
She can do that as a rank and file member like Adam Kinzinger. She cannot lead us being our sort of message master as conference chair. What they don't realize, and I wrote about this today, and one member um, made this point, is that this question won't go away. Once she's purged from the party, it will continue. You purged a, a truth teller. You purged someone who's trying to save democracy and save your party, and you you backed a liar, and you elevated someone who's willing to feed the big lie, which Elise Stefanik has been doing. And so it is, it's exactly as we're all describing, a short-term strategy um, where the party will suffer long-term as a result. And what's so fascinating about what Liz Cheney has been doing is she made this choice months ago, knowing she would lose likely her leadership post and then her district in Wyoming. She was the one who organized the letter from all former 10 living secretaries of defense published January 3rd about not having the, about the military not being allowed to be involved in partisan electoral disputes. All this stuff has been leaked in the last few days. By who? The world and allies of Liz Cheney. And what that shows is she has nothing left to lose and she's not going to let this go. It's so interesting indeed. Uh, Robert Gibbs, let's talk about President Obama welcoming Mitch McConnell and others. Uh, President Biden, excuse me, welcoming <laughs> <laughs> Mitch McConnell and others to the White House today. Just after Mitch McConnell has said that he's 100 percent dedicated to stopping the Biden White House. So, you know, this is all going to happen this week. What, uh, you know, what running room does the president have? How much should he wait for bipartisan support? Or does he need to because he's not going to have full Democratic support for some of these proposals and he's going to have to scale them back in any case? Well, Andrew, clearly the, the clock is ticking and, and the White House is going to have to make a decision certainly sooner rather than later because the longer that this legislation creeps into um, past the August recess and into Labor Day and past that, uh, the, the more likely this thing grinds to nowhere. I do think, though, the administration is smart in taking the temperature of Republicans and seeing if they can't get something on a bipartisan basis, something that can show the American people that there are some things that people can agree on on both sides, uh, and then taking the remainder of the infrastructure and the family plan and doing it via reconciliation. So I, I think they're making a smart political play. I think it will help them either in the short run uh, get something on a bipartisan basis or in a long run in showing that Republicans don't really have anything involved in wanting to have uh, a bipartisan agenda. I think you have to get caught trying in many ways uh, if you're going to try to keep going through the reconciliation route. Gibbs, Steele, and Stoddard, a great panel. Thank you. We have to leave it there.